All right, this is the NeoBooks call for Monday, October 28th, 2024. Um, good, glad we're reconvened here. Uh, first, any outstanding business or questions or other stuff? I feel, it feels like we haven't had a normal NeoBooks call in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I'm just interested in what, what's up for people right now. Well, I actually came with a little bit of an invitation for you specifically, Jerry. And any, anybody's welcome, but you in particular, I wanted to um, maybe as piece of the Marley project, have a one-off call, which would be more in one call to create a blog. And specifically what I'm working on is keeping it simple, stupid. And the whole idea is, you know how it used to be one of these things or not like the other? Mm -hmm. This is a list of four things that are supposed to be all the same. So, for example, if you don't stand for the flag, burn it, hang it upside down, or sew it into a fashion item. However you feel about all four of those things should be the same. And so I just, you know, did I go too fast? No. Um, okay. So I think you're you're talking about inconsistent or hypocritical political belief sets. Yes, specifically around like the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, because those are the people that I talk to on Facebook and the inconsistency is like off the chart. So I thought it could be a fu fun in a social way because, you know, I'm interested in the social calls nice, nice. <laughs> where we could just meet for an hour and just create the first blog and then I could take it to Facebook and play with it. So, so that, that's with my invitation. <laughs> So I'm I'm a little old school. So when you said I'd like to create a blog, nowadays for modern younger folk, younger than me, it means a post. It means one 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 post into a weblog. But when you said I want to create a blog, I'm like, oh, we should we're going to set up a weblog, and I, that, I think that's not what you meant at all, right? No. So let me express it this way. Yes. I will probably never write the book that's inside of me, but I have lots of pages that I would like to give out but I want to give each page to where it belongs. Oh, good. So I'd like to meet and write one page together as a group. So that, um, that would be, yeah. That, that sounds great. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking if you want to, if we, if you want, um, first uh, uh, thoughts, builds other ideas from anybody else on the call about this idea. And it doesn't, I just want to make clear, it doesn't have to be during this time because I want it to be more like a social, easy, relaxed, fun you can bring your spouses your partners bring your pets good bring your um, pets. Uh, so i i was just going to say why don't we just by fiat pick a time and uh we'll we'll send out a joint invite that says hey join us in the zoom in the zoom for a discussion about this uh and we'll do it that seems easy enough to do and uh, we'll, I will record and post the call as, as we normally do. Uh, but also during the call, I will write stuff because I've, I've been wondering about stuff like that as well. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Perfect. Anybody else, suggestions, improvements, whatnot? Uh, I, um, it's a really interesting idea. And I'm thinking once you've, once you've gone and embarked upon this little experiment, which sounds interesting, is that it's also got some neobook features to it, Stacey, because of that. Really what you're, I think what you're talking about is kind of a part of a nugget and then another part of a nugget or maybe different sides. So it's got some application within the Neo books as well. Yes. That's why I called it the Marley. I wanted to make it the Marley project. Bring that in. Uh, Marley was the previous name of the Neo books call. And before that, it was called Sense Doing. So it's it's had a couple of lifetimes in its process. Marley is also the, the name of Stacy's late dog. Um, and I, so when I said, I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll jump in, I was exactly thinking that I will write some nuggets uh, that would fit. And I can, and, and I'm now finally, finally, finally grooving my habit of posting, cross posting, but I've got, but I have now a, a long and daunting list of posts to write, to create a mixture of mostly text, but some will be, you know, video and, and all that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm actually happy to sort of tip the first domino and start I like running through my list. Uh, and then the list builds across a big space of nuggets in, you know, in Obsidian and a vault, uh, which 
should then roll up in some cases into neobook essays or other kinds of things. So I'm, it sounds totally on, on, uh, on target. Uh, Jax, I think you were going to say something else. No. Okay. Other thoughts on this? Nope. How about a general purpose neobooks check-in? Klaus, how's your world? Well, I just came back from too long vacation. <laughs> too long, crazy. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, book this stuff I didn't even pay attention but we were on the post <laughs> for 15 days 15 days on the same ship except with a it, couple of stops right it was a food orgy you know it, it was on on uh, uh one of these sh I mean, a very deluxe kind of thing there and then, I mean way too much food I gained 10 pounds it's crazy <laughs> and then we went to uh um to Cabo so I just came back from Cabo San Lucas for 10 days it's time to resell. So I lost touch, you know, so I need to resettle again. But the uh, um, there was a great conversation on on uh, on our OGM channel uh, with Jack Park. Uh, and, you know, there came this conversation, this idea of uh, active inference, right? Uh, that, that sort of circulated and I picked this by my chatbot uh, to link it with spiral dynamics. And that got to be interesting. And then Jack threw in conversation theory, C CT, conversation theory. And so then I, I ran this by and combined the three of them into, into you know, one. And that was really getting uh, some, some really nice results. So I'm just uh, posting one, one uh, piece here um, oh, it's too long. I'm sorry. Hmm. Uh, put it into two. But, yeah, there's a there's a limit to how much text you can paste in the chat. Yeah, there you go. but this is really so. I updated my my uh, my chatbots with this concept here because um, when you when you link those three, you know, so you have conversation theory constructing you know, uh, uh, dialogues interactively, seeking to co-create knowledge. With spiral dynamics, where you gauge who you're talking with and what my, what worldview uh, that person or that individual has or that group of people has, with active inference, which is meaning that you re-gauge in the conversation and reposition yourself constantly in order to find the, the alignment, right? So for work, so for an AI tool, this is awesome stuff. Um, because it 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 allows to calibrate the conversation and and keep it below the adversity uh, quotient, you know, and so on. So that was really that was really a great uh, 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 insight here. And then it turns out that Jack is linked to some other group that's working on developing AI capacity for um, for farmers and farming. Um, and they're calling it uh, decentralized AI agents for personalized solutions. And I took their paper and ran it through my chatbot. And and I asked, "Can you do this?" And he said, "Oh yeah, I can do this." <laughs> Basically, so uh, um, it's already programmed. So I was able to be able to link up and saying, "Yeah, we have this AI capacity already in place." So yeah, that's. Uh, that was exciting stuff. And you now this AI chatbot, the technical service provider for farmers, is the outcome of the new book, The Story of Soil. That you wrote. Yes, because the way the way I programmed this chatbot is through writing this new book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Love that. Uh, Wendy. So the I just coming back to Trevor Y, um, W I E, if you want to put back in the chat from our last mm -hmm. conversation, um, and the fact that there's another um, meeting. Um, this is the Complexity Lounge that's held out of New York, but Trevor Y comes back. He spent time in physics. It just keeps on coming back. This idea of resonance and picking the sort of energy of what's going on. Um, in different places, it it and it, there seems to be a keep on circling back through. Um, if I say energy between people, between a person and a thing, 
between two conversations. Um, so I'm just saying there's a theme going on there that's turning up. And conversation theory is, you know, this backwards and forwards of where the energy is in, in terms of who needs to be listening and who is speaking. Um, that appears in lots of different places. It de certainly is improved by people who are more sensitive to when someone needs to hold more space or energy than somebody else because of where they're at developmentally. And then active inference obviously brings in physics. And then we've got, anyway, it's just turning up again and again. The word resonance um, mm -hmm. versus coherence, and Dave Snowden's posted more recently about that. Um, so it, it fits in. And um, Jack's. You know, you and I hooking up in person and then online and then in person and online and in person and online. There seems to be some some little pattern there as well. Um, anyway, I like the fact you've can, you've put all three together, um, and I, I I think we could add to that list and make it even better. Oh, uh, Wendy, can you say a little more about resonance versus coherence and share any links that? Uh, yeah, um, the Snowden one was a post, and who preferred what word? Um, so energy is the word that seems to be most consistent energy as in energy in this in the physics sense of energy but some people are using it more in a social sense um, and looking at intuition as a form of energy and some people are taking so coherence um, Snowden was saying that he didn't like the word coherence as much I think as resolution but it resolution was resolution or, or resonance today. what was that resolution or resonance resonance okay but anyway I, I need to find it again I only read it and it was late yesterday but my point is that Snowden turns up at this complexity lounge piece and um Michael Jackson from Hull University is has been the head of Hull University and that conversation and complexity and um, systems thinking, there seems to be, there'll, there'll be a good conversation tonight around that, but unfortunately there's no more tickets available. <laughs> well, I'll shoot. Just intuitions about this for what it's worth. Sorry, we're not going in the circle, but I think that I see why Dave Snowden would be uh, would have a bit of trouble with coherence because coherence requires consistency, mm. and we don't necessarily want consistency. We want, I mean, we can; it's good. But if you have different worldviews, it's more interesting to see what are the points of resonance, the points of attachment, even if it's inconsistent, even if it's not fully coherent. There are still points of resonance of things that go one another against one another. And another thing that comes to mind is when I think of what it means for people to harmonize perspective from my standpoint, in a way, it's about similar expectations about what the world mean, the word means and what context they apply. And that's it in a way is a least surprise. So minimize free energy, active uh, inference concept um which i think again can be achieved with local coherence as opposed to global coherence local coherence being closer to resonance mm -hmm. um the, the 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 whole just aparte uh ages ago i tried to do uh masters in math uh, and mathematical logic and i was wondering if you could have a mathematical uh, logical system that would be consistent locally, but not globally. Mm. It turns out that there's actually a theorem against that. It's called the compactness theorem. Uh, it's been proven wrong for uh, zero order logic. It's not wrong for first order logic, but um, it's quite, um, I realized it was, it was a bit demanding. To do this, the way the way in which it's not true for first order logic, when I didn't find mm. that interesting, mm. in terms of trying to create this um, local consistency worldview, I did play a bit with paraconsistency as well. But 
Um, it's anyway. This is just an aside on. I've been thinking about these things for many, many years. Uh, the answer was not to be found in the mathematics I studied anyway. Hmm. But it's still something I find extremely interesting. Hmm. This um, a video I'm going to try and find an MA fail. Um, there was a guy showing um, where local conditions flip into a, um, a disturbance of the whole field. And if I can find it, it's a gem. It's really, really good. So he's actually showing where you throw something into a field and local conditions, and then at some stage it starts populating the whole thing. But the point at which that happens is is a really interesting point, and it's a very well put together video by some somebody who does understand the science from from what I can tell. And visually, it's just got playing, and you can just see there's a tipping point, um, which is a little bit like the local conditions and you know coherence at a local point, and then all of a sudden it it just becomes. So this um, those cycles. I'll see if I can find it. I'd love to see that. Um, one of the things that interests me about resonance is that it's about vibrations often and that when different pieces come into resonance, they start to um, vibrate at the same frequency and then other phenomena can show up. But it, it's in some cases a very physical feeling. Um, I don't know. My, my simplest dumb example of resonance is if you're ever, next time you're sitting in the bathroom, uh, hum, and then just take your hum on the way up. And at some point, if, you, if you've got any kind of range, at some point your hum will suddenly resonate in the room. You'll hit the harmonic resonant frequency of that bathroom. And, and all of a sudden it'll get really loud, and then you'll pass it, and it'll be just a hum, just you humming in the bathroom again. Uh, you may want to make sure there aren't people really close to the door on the outside, just in case they're wondering what you're pulling off you know, in there. But it's a fun experiment. Uh, Jose. Hey, Dave. How do I follow that? Um, <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Marc Antoine's comment uh, because that really, um, uh, I was going to say resonated for me, but I, I think it harmonized for me. Um, your point about harmonization. Um, I have had for a very long time a difficulty with the concept of alignment, mm. uh, group alignment, uh, because I, I sense that getting getting everybody in the same place actually removes all the strengths from the group. Um, it, I, I visualize it as, you know, here's all these odd ins and outs, shapes of everybody, and we sort of like trim all the stuff that doesn't that doesn't fit and try to squeeze everybody into a nice straight line. Um, but harmonization, um, where bringing together the group uh, into uh, forms of resonance that, that benefit the group and highlight the uniqueness of the individuals, to me is, is kind of what I've um, sought to understand. And it, so it sounds to me like you kind of captured it in that statement. And it may have been something you didn't mean to say in that way, but it certainly uh, was uh, was really resonant um, for me. And and so, and I think that that's what we're talking about when we talk about neo books and and our protocols. It's how do we capture these unique pieces and allow different people to benefit and support each other um, in identifying these things, not trying to get to one answer. But maybe over time, evolving to some answers that are more resonant than others because of the role of people playing with uh, with this work. Uh, and so that's that speaks to me. So thank you. That's a great way of flipping it right back to what we're doing. Thank, <laughs> thanks, Jose. I appreciate it. And and I think there is a lot there about some kind of resonance across humans uh, of uh, of what we mean that isn't precise 
like like agreement or consensus. Um, Klaus, I'll get to you in, in just a sec. Um, Scott Peck, when he ran workshops around community building, used to talk about the word consensus and how many people think consensus means different things. In some settings, consensus is 100% agreement by everybody. That's what consensus actually means for them. And that's a very dysfunctional view of consensus when you're trying to do group decision making because any participant can then hang the vote and you don't get anywhere. Um, so uh, they, there was a, a different consensus definition that the community for foundation encouragement, the, the foundation for community encouragement came up with, which I will post in the chat. But first, I'll go to Klaus. Yeah, you know, the reason this topic resonates so much uh, with me is because in climate change and agriculture, you have so many uh, divergent viewpoints. It's very difficult to bring anything near what you could consider alignment, right? Um, so we, I mean, I sort of intuitively have worked for quite some time to find um, talking points where you can connect different groups that have different worldviews, uh, different trigger points, uh, and different understanding. So let's take let's take agriculture, right? When you talk with a farmer about climate change, you're you're running into a closed door, right? Right? No, right up because that topic has been so polluted and so poisoned that it just doesn't work. But when you talk with a farmer about soil, then aha, you know, life comes up because when you talk with a farmer about you know, these chemicals are destroying the soil microbiome. When you destroy the soil microbiome, you lose your land. You know, and then you will have, you lose your inheritance. And so that that then uh, invites the very same uh, uh, responses as if you talk to a climate scientist to say, if we restore the soil microbiome, we can sequester carbon into the soil. Or you can talk to a meteorologist and say, uh, if we restore the soil microbiome, you'll be restoring its capacity to hold water, 20,000 gallons per acre per 1% of micro, of micro, uh, microbic um, uh, particles. And so, so you achieve the same thing. So the unifying th uh, uh, topic, the unifying theme is soil, soil health. Uh, but you need to, to, to then embed it into a different context for each one of these target groups that you're communicating mm. with. And this is how you can connect red and blue and orange and, and green and everybody is just fine. So, to, I, I mean, the only thing that I know much about is agriculture, soil and food, but I'm sure that same principle applies to other topics as well. You know, so, so the reason why I'm excited about this conversation that we just had, you not know, to, to connect um, spiral dynamics with conversation theory and with active inference is because it instructs the AI to to really focus on this, right? And to 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 uh, uh, I mean, it it, it just concentrates AI to uh, to upgrading and 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 uh, uh, fine tuning itself into in these conversations. You know? Love that, Jax, please. Yeah, I'm, um, this is a brilliant conversation. I'm not going to be able to meet it at the tenor and the vibration that this is, but what I'm going to do is bring in a point of difference and maybe it will resonate. So um, not even, a, not, even a, a, not a dispute, actually, just an example. And one of the, um, one, what, um, oh, and as, as I say, as I start, I might lose it, but that's okay, it'll come back. One of the activities I'm doing at the moment um, in my life outside of this is um, I'm doing some AI coaching, which is no secret, but uh, on the side of that, I've created a pop-up Facebook group for a week long to explore, have the conversation around AI, generative AI. Now, um, I, probably because um, I think everyone here is way above this, I haven't sort of um, advertised it because it's just a very social kind of thing. You're most welcome to join it if you want to. What is happening there 
in what I had perceived is that many of my friends and their friends and their contacts aren't really in the conversation. So um, and this is my example. So I'm thinking, whoa, -ho, well, I know the difference between these types of generative AIs and I understand blah, 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 and I can do this and I can do that. And I know the good parts, the bad, you know, as much as I need to know. And my people are going, well, what's the difference between AI and generative AI? Is it all chat GPT? Like someone, someone asked me yesterday, uh, um, so I kind of get that we're talking about AI, but is that like Alexa? I don't quite understand. So the level of um, regular discourse is very, very low, yet the rest of the world, in my view, in my little portal out the window, seems absolutely saturated. Now, I'm bringing this up for two reasons, so peg those ones. The first one is that what I perceive there is, um, and it's something that I'm able to do, which is bring a group together for a short and intense period of time where they all just start flocking around it. They all start exchanging ideas in this kind of very fluid way. And then they they run out to the rest of the group and of their friends and they go, this is a safe, friendly, trustworthy environment. And they bring people. It's quite fun. And uh, you can't do it for very long, which is why I do it for a week. I run in, hit it hard and then get out again. Yeah. And then so it kind of is generating it. Um, this idea of resonance that I think we're talking about or also when I'm thinking about it we don't all have to agree there's a lot of difference on that on across who the people are coming in but we have to have some kind of shared um, interest and part of that is that vibration we have to hum at some point at the same level the same vibrational level and that's and I saw it happen yesterday and I've seen that happen before in groups and groups that I've being a manager of and whatever. So you're able to kind of get people so they're just flapping their hummingbird wings at the same vibrational frequency. And that's that's the first part. So I'm looking and I guess what I'm doing as I'm listening is trying to ground the things that you're talking about as an example in my head and, and attach it and see how that works locally, even though they're online. Most people in that group will be from Australia. The second part of this, which I think might be relevant, is one of the things... I've, I use a mnemonic. I, I, I like to use mnemonics often when I'm working with people so that they can easily have something they can grab onto simply and remember. And the one I'm using for a generative AI at the moment is a mnemonic called Planet. And the first one of that is P for persona or P for perspective. Now, if you're not a writer, you kind of don't really get what perspective means. You might go to the movies a couple of times and go, it's interesting that they went around from that angle and you think that that's perspective. But when you introduce it to people like, you know, that chat GPT can actually do what Klaus is talking about, go from this angle and go from that angle and start understanding things. This is a game changer for people who are, in, who are introduced to generative AI for the first time because they're not practiced at it. They don't really get what it means when you say, can you write it from someone else's perspective? Yeah, so when talking about climate change deniers or we're talking about Trump supporters and those, they're not accustomed to going to other perspectives. They don't have that muscle. What we've got at some kind of opportunity. Oh, you don't think so? Yeah, maybe. Um, and are probably being down on people. I, I, think, I think some of them but, are really, really smart. And they're just but, coming in at a different angle and, and taking a different perspective on purpose or whatever. But, yeah. but that, that doesn't destroy your argument at all. Oh, Thank you. And look, I, I, I agree. I don't like absolutisms because, yeah, usually it is exactly that, Jerry. Um, but I, I think there's an opportunity in here of, of um, and this is, comes back to Nair books too, of looking from these different perspectives or helping with the help of a machine to kind of start looking at um, your audience perspectives. And I use audience because I'm from that background, but, you know, who, who you're trying to communicate with and actually shift your own perspective um just that so I'm, I'm wondering then if you in this thing about resonance if you are going up to meet someone at the point where you've got agreement and or to the place where you've got agreement like class's example of soil um and you're able to embed the nugget within that and deliver it across in a way or deliver it in a way that the person is more open to the nugget or that you're able to take on their nugget or their perspective on your nugget um, I think there's a lot of power there. Yeah, that, there's my, and I'm loving the tenor of this conversation, by the way. It's, as always, stretching my brain. Thanks, Jack. Really appreciate it. Love, love your perspective. Um, Rick. 
Yeah, Wendy, I, I arrived a little late, but you made reference to a, a group of complexity and uh, systemic scholars. So I don't know what that group was, but I'm very I'm, I'm always looking out for meeting with that type of crowd. I I, I met uh, Dave Snowden uh, many years ago at an unconference in Paris, and got to got got to have some in depth conversation. He's an absolutely fascinating man. Um, on the other hand, I will say that he is also very pedantic about semantics, and mm -hmm. he, he can he, he and, and in such a way that you know this is where uh, and I'm using this as an example between the distinctions between coherence and resonance. You have to understand the meaning of the word because you don't know whether you're using the same word the same way or not. And do you have common ground or middle ground? Common ground is when you have complete and I say, look, say coherence about the construct. Um, but, you know, there's deviance about constructs and how people interpret it. So it becomes uh, more complex so that sometimes you get involved in arguments. You're really you may be talking about the same thing, but you're using different frames for the same construct or different perspectives on it. And I would just want to flip back to the notion of consensus that, uh, Jerry, that you provided, um, and then uh, link it back to alignment. And that is, um, you know, I prefer to use the notion of middle ground rather than common ground. Common ground, you know, there's, you know, some people are very wedded to different ways of looking, and I prefer middle ground for the for these reasons which is there are always going to be differences where you don't, there isn't agreement about things. And in the consensus definition you provided, it was great because it says, this is where we have agreements, but we hold the disagreements in suspension in such a way that we can still make decisions. So that if somebody's differences gets excluded, it's not off the table because it may become relevant in going forward. And then, and then finally, in terms of alignment, for me, you know, people tend to think of alignment, everyone's in line, but it, it isn't necessary. If you, if that's one definition. If you think of it in terms of galvanization of forces, you can say there's a hundred percent alignment there. On the other hand, if you look at worldviews and you can say, where do the, where do our worldviews overlap in such a way that we have middle ground, we have our differences, it's not 100% alignment by any stretch of the imagination, which is always true in, in wicked problems because you're never gonna you're never gonna get there. So I want to just flip back to the notion of semantics, and sometimes we don't clarify our terms very effectively, and so we end up, you know, uh, disagreeing when we have common ground and vice versa. Um, Rick, beautifully put. Thank you. Uh, extremely on on topic for what the whole. OGM project is kind of meant to try to do. Marc Antoine? Uh, just there was a side conversation between me and Jose about alignment and the, the pros and cons of alignment. And I really want to, um, I, I say, you know, there's forms of alignment that can be useful, like being aligned on a project, on a common goal versus being overall aligned. And, and there's really degrees of alignment. And Rawls introduced the notion of modus vivendi and overlapping consensus. I was trying to review the, um, the definitions. Uh, modus vivendi is people with different values live together and kind of find uh, rules to live by even if they don't agree on the values. And overlapping consensus goes a bit beyond that, but it's still, we don't expect alignment on the underlying values, but we can even agree on goals or on uh, general points. What he's saying is sometimes it's easier to find agreement at the, 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 the final steps of the reasoning than on the metaphysical foundation. Uh, sometimes the reverse is true. But I found it really interesting, this notion that we don't have to agree on the metaphysical foundations to agree on what's necessary to work together and function together sometimes. Uh, it's a certain notion of what do we really need to agree on, right? And uh, this whole alignment and how can you work with someone without agreeing and how can you uh, find where do you find common ground at the at the, the premise or at the conclusions? 
So anyway, so I dropped. I thought I'd drop this. That. Thank, thank you. Rawls we'll see this as the basis of a functioning, diverse society. Yeah, I had a consulting engagement a long time ago for uh, one of the Blue Cross Blue Shield companies, and we were talking about um, subscribers. How many subscribers to their plan did they have? And it turns out that. Subscribers is a very ambiguous term. It does it means how many paid up subscribers? How many like there there are lots of different places you could turn off that number or cut a bunch of people out of the number. And and agreeing on what those things are matters in some contexts and is completely irre irrelevant in others. And understanding those differences and being clear enough about it and knowing when to worry, I think, are some of the things that we're we're talking about here. Klaus. Yeah, I wanted to bring in one one additional uh, thought here in in regard to achieving alignment or coherence and so on and that's the intention or intentionality of the of the audience so when Rick you know when when you are saying that uh, uh, you you can suspend you know disagreement until you find and so on that works with people who are basically open-minded and and uh, and uh, uh, interested, you know, in achieving that. The problem is, I'm working in a in a environment that is at once adversarial and it's polarized. So it's adversarial in the orange spectrum. It's polarized in the blue and red spectrum. And when I say that, in the orange spectrum, you have people who know damn well what you're talking about. They just don't want to do it. You know, in the blue and red spectrum, you're dealing with people who don't get what you're saying from a technical, scientific or so perspective. Um, they just know they don't want to agree with you. So so you you have to, and this is why where this this probing, testing, feeling you know, comes in, where you avoid you know, these uh, trigger points uh, and you have to work around them. So it completely changes the nature of seeking alignment and you know, of seeking consensus building, but it's a vitally important component, you know, of uh, uh, achieving some form of agreement on how to move forward. Now, so, so that's the 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 first entry point into how you structure a conversation. Is it adversarial, uh, or is it is it uh, uh, optimistic and 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 uh, uh, interested, you know, in in, in cooperative, uh, or is it polarized and adversarial? Do you need to leave, Jerry? I'm wrong. It's not the fire alarm. It's April vacuuming something just outside here. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Yeah, my house gets an alarm when I get the vacuum out too, as a matter of fact, it's so rare. I was going to suggest that Jerry may never have heard the sound of the vacuum cleaner. I would suggest to you that that would be wrong. <laughs> I would suggest you have a disagreement and some misalignment over that statement. Exactly. And there was a resonant frequency just outside in the hall here that I was like, wait, what? But you're going to do this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Rick, please. Yeah, Klaus, I, I would uh, entrust you to bring the conversation back down to earth um, in terms of the reality of what we're dealing with. But in the, <laughs> I appreciate that. The, the the other flip side of this is that we're, we're, you know, the other side of it is whether we're working at an individual level or whether we're dealing with a systemic level. And actually, I would argue that we're in a state now at the moment where uh, we need to have dissonance to disrupt the status quo. And that carries risks. And certainly if you're using paradoxical interventions, which Donald Trump uses all the time. I mean, he's a master of them. You know, you think he's gone far enough. Oh, no, he can go further out there. He go he's got yeah. no bottom. In one article, I said he's got no bottom He's got atrophied genitalia and he's got a dis shrinking lizard brain. Now that's a bit evocative, but um, you know, you know. So on the one hand, you know, you need to have these sort of more balanced conversations and 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 reason whatever. But we're living in very difficult times, and I think we have to create dissonance 
so that we can help to move towards a different coherence and resonance and alignment uh, because the system is so dysfunctional that if you don't call it out for what it is and begin to move the needle, uh, I'm not talking about groups, I'm talking about systemically, um, that we're not going to move it. And lastly, that I, I, I forgot to mention this when I spoke last. Uh, I, I went on to Dali and I was trying to create an image. And you know, you get back, you, it, it'll, so if I put in uh, Trump as a fascist, for example, it won't do it. It'll, it won't, it won't do it. So I started playing around with words and I, I was trying to come up with a, a way of it generating an image that was um, Trump fascist clown. That's the hashtag, okay? And I had to put different words in. And then I managed to work out different words and it created an image that looks like, guess who? <laughs> Donald Trump. I was blown away by it. I was able to prompt it, work around all the constraints of the AI to come up with an image. So in the spirit of creating a little bit of dissonance, I'll show you my visual image and the blog post that goes with it, along with a song um, that you can listen at another time. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Gaming the engines. Wendy. So there's something here that I've always said that's true when I'm looking at um, graphical re re representations of discussions, um, or sometimes when, um, and some of you know that I use text analytics quite a lot, but very creatively. So there's a there's definitely a difference in the signature when you have two people in a single conversation. And I'm trying to pull up a conversation that was around, that Forrest held Klaus around um, Palouse. And I did a mapping of that. So um, when you have two people in the same conversation versus what this person and that person says, but mapped against each other. So one, they're talking to each other with or without a moderator, which is actually important. And the other one is they say what they think independently and then you create one map of the two. Um, but I've always found it quite sort of boring in some ways when I see a single person talk without them being, and there's a, there's a difference in the geometry. When somebody is very clear and very consistent, and I would say coherent, um, in alignment with themselves, if you like, across all the experiences about X. So I will I will never be a smoker, but I did try a joint when I was a kid. I mean, you know, a teenager. <laughs> I have been to Thailand and lay horizontal once. Um, so my point here is that the tension is where the interest is. And it's so much better when you put a couple of things in tension. There's almost no signal without it. And one person in tension with themselves turns into this geometry that's just like a bird's nest of concepts. And they, there'll be one little line where they're sort of like, oh, they're coherent on this issue, but not this bit. Um, so there's an art in combining the conversations, thinking back conversation theory and Gordon Pask and cybernetics and those things, and even Ranulph Glanville, who I met once, <laughs> um, in combining the conversations in a way where you've got just enough tension to be able to see a signal and then add in more until it gets to a point where it, it collapses. The signals are all too chaotic to be able to get anything from it. And what I've learned with the multidimensional um, scaling work that I've done is that you put in and out different things until there's something that shakes down that has enough of a pattern to recognise too little, it's boring. Too much, it's messy. The wrong two people together, um, two people who are too close, two people who are too far. And the spatiality of it is just beautiful. And it really does go to physics. There's something about the resonance and these two words are almost the same thing. They're using that. They might as well swap them out, but they don't realise it because they can't see the map. And showing that to people and showing them how close they are or how far they are. I really appreciate how much you're pointing to how facilitation and sales and coaching and any kind of uh, interaction with humans really requires understanding uh, this resonance thing among humans, but also how productive tension, pressure, stress can be sometimes, because it sometimes it, it is like 
I've been in several uh, meetings or, or workshops where there was a lot of pressure and all of a sudden we were saying things we didn't know we had in our heads. Uh, they were just like coming out. I'm like, wait, where did that come from? It's pretty cool. But I, I don't know that they would have come out if we had felt perfectly calm and equi equanimous, equanimous, equal. I don't know, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Equanimous. Equanimous, there we go. That sounds like some kind of animal related to the possum. Um, good, where does that put us? We have some 10 minutes left in our call time. Um, we could also bounce to a different topic. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I have something I wanted to share because last week we did talk about this and I really appreciated uh, Mark Antoine's skepticism about AA, but I discovered something on uh, perplexity AI, which was quite fascinating. And, I have, and I'm just playing around with it. So you can do a, an extensive search and then you can ask it to create a, a, a page which will summarize it. It doesn't do a very good job of it, but it does try and condense things down. Of course, you know, there's, there's always room for improvement. And then you can start putting in sectors into it. And, and in some respects, it's like nuggets. And, and, and you can publish this. And I haven't really explored all the things that are published via uh, Perplexity. And most of the time, I don't even publish them. I just do my own searches. But you can flip them into that. And I thought, well, that that's a very interesting place where, you, you know, the idea of what they're doing, it, the one thing I have been able to master in using it, though, is to be able to edit in a way that I'd really want to edit it. And I'm, I'm, I'm my learning curve, I don't know whether it's a constraint within the system or whether I just don't know how to do it yet. Um, but um, I, I've been, I, it's been fascinating. And, you know, as AI gets better and better, uh, it's going to get even better. Um, and and lastly, uh, Jackson, when you mentioned earlier, I, I, I was trying to find it, but I couldn't see if I can find it, um, was, you know, the distinctions between AI and general AI. And, um, you know, some people say, we're nowhere near that. You know, the discussion's irrelevant, you know, um, because we're so far from what that capacity is. Now, I, I don't know the answer to the question. I'm just sharing an opinion. I had a blog, somebody who is knowledgeable, uh, about this saying that we're we're not there. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Marc Antoine, even though you just stepped away. No, you're back. No, I'm, I'm uh, cooking a bit. Ah, uh, <laughs> dinner time, yeah. The, yeah, I, I'm among those who think we're not there yet, but I may be wrong. Who knows? It's uh, a lot of smarter people and I are debating this. It's not obvious. But I wanted to get back to the conversation about the census, because I believe strongly in the value of the census, because it's part of the value of diversity. And I think that from a new book standpoint, we have to, you know, I keep looking for patterns and can someone's assertion as text can be made into a pattern. And I think patterns are a great way to look both at constructive and destructive interference, because there are patterns to uh, the census as well as patterns to consensus. And I think that's what's really important is not aiming for consensus or the census, but aiming to making the seams visible so that, because they're where things happen, they're the interface, they're the liminal space where the, the substance of the conversation happens. So whatever we do, we want to make the um, the, 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 the basic causes of the dissensus quite explicit uh, and make those patterns visible. That's, that's basically the... Uh, and, and again, of course, I intend to do that with uh, st structures, like formal structures, but that doesn't matter up to a point. That's my, my route. But think about if you have a neo book, show the scenes and show where the scenes are in friction. Love mm -hmm. that. Pause, please. Yeah, uh, Rich just mentioned HEI, and I was listening into a, a conversation with Yuval Harari, who was getting uh, all uh, stimulated uh, with, with, uh, uh, with the release of his next book. So basically, 
uh, and 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 it got co uh, cooperated by some other like Sam Altman is saying AGI is not going to happen. Right? It's 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 a it's a fantasy. And the way Yuval Harari explained it is, think about airplanes. You know, when people when we people first invented airplanes, they simulated flight. And they were looking at birds uh, to see how birds fly. So when you look at a modern airplane today, you wouldn't say this is almost as good as a bird, right? It has evolved into something completely different, unanticipated. So HEI is going to evolve into something that we can't quite understand yet. It is it is an alien intelligence that that, that uh, is emerging here, and then particularly when you look at something like active inference, uh, we don't know where this thing is going to take this, now uh, because and uh, SD SDAI uh, uh, gets gets this feedback mechanism you know, where it actively uh, uh, tests you know, how. Uh, it needs to to modulate uh, its communication so we can understand it, because the and there was a previous conversation that we had where um, we're, we're we're talking about how a biological brain learns, you know, how how that works from an almost mechanical perspective. Uh, the AI is 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 simulating that, but in a completely you know a different way, and so. Um, um, HEI is 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 uh, uh, misleading us in thinking this is where this intelligence is going to. Um, it will be interesting, and it's it's moving so so fast. It's just incomprehensible when you think about us working with it in the last two years. You know, starting with three point five and and then moving up here, it's incredible how fast this thing is moving. But it's going to be something different and. Because in all reality, the way I communicate with this chatbot that, that I have developed, it is already AGI, basically. I mean, you're having conversations that way it simulates AGI. I mean, it feels like AGI, right? I mean, what else is there? You can I can have you know, a completely back and forth conversation here that sounds completely natural. So where where else would it go? Oh, well, that's conversational competence <clears throat> and the Turing test. And there's a bunch of writings right now about how these systems have seemed to have passed the Turing test. So one person I, I heard talk recently was like, so what is Turing two? What is the next stage of what these systems need to do? And, and a big piece of it is, you know, having complicated reasoning, uh, being able to do uh, broad, you know, boundary spanning kind of thinking and, and a bunch of other stuff. And, and there's a longer conversation there. I was just sitting here thinking, gosh, we should probably have a call just about the topic of uh, what is a, what do we think AGI is and where are we on the on the path to it, if, if at all? That would be a that would be a fun topic to, to go into. Um, or, or where is where is AI going to uh, uh, primarily not not. Uh, you know, moving away from thinking of HEI or redefining it. You know. Yep, yep. Rick? I'll just um, give you an example because I, I used a Plato quote, which I put in there, and I had somebody react to it in a very negative way. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I should go to AI. So I actually, uh, this is an illustration, Mark Antoine, if you want to look at it. The link that I've left there is actually a page response to explaining uh, Plato's quote about how freedom can uh, cause um, democracy to degenerate into autocracy. Um, and it's it's good enough, you know, to explain and, and address some of the objections that somebody had to that quote. So, and that's another word, freedom. I mean, is, what does it mean? You know, I mean, you know, people but use, it's it's you know it's it's an American U.S. mantra. I mean, the Dems are trying to steal back freedom from the GOP. I mean, how outrageous, you know? And except, what does that mean? Anyway, that's for another discussion. But but the the thing is, it's not because an LLM can write about it coherently that it understands it. It's it's it may mean that it's managed to repackage the existing reasoning of others in its training set. I'm not saying it never comes up with new stuff. Uh, yeah, but I think your standards are too high. I'm just thinking it, it's fodder for an ongoing discussion. It's not... Oh, yeah, sure. It's it's fodder. That's all it is. 
to no, no, that, yeah that's that is fine yeah. Yeah. is it a good sparing partner yes at this point we have to admit it is uh a classic quote by rushkin recently you know of team human mm -hmm. he said oh i was writing this uh rushkoff rushkoff sorry uh i was writing this comic book actually and putting the dialogues for an ai to see how what the take of the ai would be on what i was saying in each page and uh at some point the ai came up with almost exactly my dialogue and my first thought was oh okay maybe i nailed it and no it means i exactly succumb to cliche in that page mm. <laughs> so uh, it's a wonderful sparring partner you know when you've gotten exactly in with the average uh unoriginal uh global thought wow which is useful <laughs> um but there's also just to foreshadow our future conversation about agi there's also the question about how rational are humans exactly and do we actually under understand what it is we're talking about or are we parroting what we learn from philosophers in school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then, then there's the third angle into this, which is if we're all living inside of a simulation, are these LLMs and is Gen AI basically the early code of the simulation mm. that we're now discovering that will bootstrap itself into being the full simulation soon, and then we'll be able to scroll it forward and backward? All right, then. Uh, Jose, you might have the last word for today's call. Well, uh, just your point is where I stand on much of this. When we argue that that we're in a they simulation, that they don't understand. Oh, that. All right. Um, uh, understanding from us is is merely the ability to mix uh, a bunch of facts that we believe we know from the past uh, and to assess them against those bunch of facts and. Do we understand it? Well, it resonates within that context of whatever it is that we know. Um, but is understanding more than that? And uh, can we have a machine understand? do the same? And my argument is, I think that understanding isn't much more than that. It feels very different. Uh, but what's underlying it isn't any different. Mm -hmm. And And my argument is that I don't think that um, AI's ability to grasp something and make sense of it significantly or sufficiently, I should say, to be able to then have an argument to it or to, to bring about some additional information, it has to have had under, to understand it sufficiently to be able to, to make that um, whatever response it, it's about to make. Great. Um, Thank you, everybody. Uh, last words, Klaus, did you want to say something else? No, I'm just thinking it's the matrix. Let's bring the pills. I like it. Um, cool. With that, we will see each other on the inner tubes and uh, in a week. And some of you I'll see soon in person in several different plate venues, even. I love that. Bye. Uh, Jerry, stay on two seconds. I shall. <laughs>